Welcome to a new episode of Access to Perspectives. We're here today with Andre, Julieta, and Alex, who all run a mentoring program, which is called Open Hardware Makers. So we're today talking about open hardware in a research context and also outside a research context. And we'll learn more about from Andre, Julie, and Alex about why um, that program exists and um, yeah, and what it's good for. <laughs> and hopefully you'll um, be interested to dig in deeper into the world of open science and open source hardware, which is really exciting as I've also learned myself. So welcome Julie, Alex and Andre. Thank you. Hi, yeah. thank you. Hello. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Nice sure. to be here. Um, we've known each other now for, well, it differs, but um, a few years, so we've also worked on one on the other project together, um, mostly around um, hardware mentoring programs. Um, so maybe let's start it by breaking the ice a little bit, but <laughs> well, there's not much ice in between us, but um, for us to get to know each other better, um, I, I also post some questions. Some of the listeners, you might have seen that in the blog post on the show notes to this podcast that uh, we also always ask our visitors and guests to share about their favorite music, favorite animals, and favorite food. So let's have a quick round um, about what, what is your favorite dish for each of you? Andre. Uh. <laughs> so I think as Brazilian, I'm going to say the really cliche thing, which is rice and beans, right? Um, which is staple food in Brazil, and I really like it a lot, and I really miss it by living abroad for so many years. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think this is mine. And I like food. Yeah. Um, so my favorite <laughs> food is spaghetti with tomato sauce, because I'm from Munich, and as you all know, Munich is the... Um, <laughs> the most northern city of Italy. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. I almost forgot about that one. Okay. <laughs> Known for Schweinsachs and other things like spaghetti and tomato sauce. Julie. Uh, it was so difficult to choose, but for me, I think um, a well done baba ganoush is kind of a staple in my diet. So easy to make, like very fast, very tasty. I would mention also all the foods back home, but many of them are vegetarian adaptations. So I don't know. I think the baba ganoush is a good good answer. Okay. And now what's your favorite animal? And then we dig into the hardware world of things. I, I have to um, add that because well, I saw Andre's response and ah. I pretty much share that. But <laughs> really give the purpose. Ah, okay. Oh, for me, it's the capybara. They are absolutely chill. They uh, they get on super well with other animals. You see other animals riding them. They, they are my favorite by far. I have to admit, I've never read the word or heard the term. What is it? Capybara. Uh, capybara. capybara. You, there are thousands of videos in the uh, along okay, the look it up. Inter yeah, yeah, just it's that's great a, just for having a good time. It's a they're, the biggest rodents, they're the biggest oh, yeah. rodents in the world, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. But they look, oh. I mean, they don't look like a, they don't look like a rat or a mouse or something like that. No. But they are the size of a, like a considerable sized dog, right? Oh, yeah. I think when I was in Panama, we saw, but they have a different name there. Mm. Or in English, yeah. they're called something else. Whatever, Alex? Uh, I, um, I really like parrots and there are so different, so many different kinds of parrots. I like them because they're, well, smart in a way and also funny and uh, small little tricksters. They can learn the human language. I find that fascinating. Like yeah, they can actually cool. learn it. There was a parrot, like a gray, what is it called? Um, Alex the gray parrot. Um, and yeah. he could actually, yeah, Alex. I, I was named after him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could actually build sentences and mean them. I know it's crazy. So see, Andre. Um, animals, uh, octopus. Um, of course. Super smart. Yeah, I mean, of yeah. course. Like all, all of the mobile, like 
<laughs> thing at all like i'm gesturing but people won't see this on the podcast <laughs> yeah, you know, on the podcast, right? yeah. so. they can predict the, the world cup results no and everything exactly <laughs> that's what i wanted to say I mean, that one died because those things they only live for three four years but it died uh, yeah three years ago so. yeah but he had a famous life and happy for being in a, yeah. in an aquarium okay Thanks for sharing that. Um, a little bit of humanness before we enter the geekiness. So now, <laughs> um, so now, what is open hardware? For those of us who might not have a clue, I mean, uh, thank, thanks to many of you, I do now. But like, okay, obviously a hardware, uh, when it comes to a research context, that would be research equipment, would be anything that you have in the kitchen that's running on electricity. But maybe not not necessarily also non-electric stuff anything that I has a what, function or what yeah i mean like recipes like for for example a gel or whatever like a special kind of gel could be also kind of a hardware like tissue specific uh, tissue and so on so i think what we wrote down um, as a definition is um, everything tangible mm -hmm. like physical objects Uh, in fact, there is a, there are like initiatives like the Open Bioeconomy Lab that are sisters to the Open Science Hardware Movement, like and um, they work on, with enzymes, right? So, so yes, I think that any any material tool you use to to perform research is considered um, hardware research hardware. Okay, mm -hmm. and why? Should it be open, or what is it? What is closed hardware, and why are we talking about open hardware here? <laughs> so I guess um, a good like a, a way I like to put things is like there is nothing good that ever came from secrecy, right? Except surprise parties, and I think <laughs> for hardware and all the things we do in the lab, that's the same, right? So if you have plans that describe how to build a certain piece of equipment in the lab or elsewhere. Um, you allow people to learn how that works, how something actually generates data for research. Um, and in the end, if you know how your tools work, you know what they can and cannot do. You can also better interpret the results of what that thing outputs, right? So you know if it's off, if it's off calibration, if it's broken, right? And also, I mean, there's so much, I don't want to say all it myself. So, but I mean, you could also repair this if it breaks. So you could also build your own, finding local tools in case you don't have uh, whatever is described because you know what each part is doing. And so in a way, from a technical point of view, this is why it's interesting to have open hardware, right? And there is, this builds up for the whole human aspect of it. Right, and then I guess either Julio or Alex want to complement this, I guess, I don't know. No, I, I think there is a whole um, kind of a being more efficient, working more efficient, more efficiently in research that is associated with open hardware because scientists are, uh, and, and there is even studies on this, on how scientists are the users of technology that are more inclined to modify their their technology all the time because research puts new challenges ahead all the time um, and in the last decades modifying your technology becomes more and more and more difficult because you don't have access as Andrea was mentioning you have no idea with how the tool is working and uh, unless you reverse engineer which demands a lot of time and effort so so I think there is like a, um, a gap there where open hardware, well, it, people, that's why most people are building open hardware, just to, to be able to better understand, as Andrea was saying, and, and modify the tools so they can adapt to new research needs, but also because of access, because there are so many uh, researchers in different contexts around the world who, don't, who cannot access the tools for research due to different reasons that we can dive in later. Um, and open hardware is given a possibility for them to gain access to those tools by downloading a design, modify, making the modifications you need, implementing the design locally. So I, I think access and possibility of 
customizing equipment are the, the two drivers here. Um, um, one thing I want to add is that it's also a lot about reproducibility, right? So um, if you also know how like the instruments are built and, and set up, then this is also part of like trying to reproduce um, an ex experimental setup. And so I'm, 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 I'm a molecular biologist and um, in our lab, like, we lost a bit of focus on the machines we were using, but still we were complaining about that this machine produces uh, different values with the same measurements. And um, this is something, uh, yeah, would, would be easier um, to explain if one would know what's, what's going on inside and if not working with a black box, right? Yeah, I think it's also has come um, but the issues have come that research results in some cases are not comparable anymore because there is no, um, there's no market for research equipment, which has evolved also by companies who provide the equipment, who make it their unique selling point to specialize on certain types of research and then make it a mass product because especially molecular biology and drosophila and C. elegans research has scaled tremendously. So there's also a need for mass production of such equipment, which then comes with proprietary hardware in this case, um, which ensures the sustainability of a company, but then it might lead to what you just described, Alex, to the, that it's not possible to compare results anymore because we don't know what's going on inside. So, but also beyond, yeah. beyond that, that is, of course, super important. There is a real threat to labs because if production is so concentrated in a couple of manufacturers and one of them goes out of business, mm -hmm. then what do you do? Um, and not only if they go out of business, if you want, want to customize or you want to repair something, you are directly tied to the vendor and usually uh, labs are not that important to exert a proper pressure on the vendor to really get that, that attention first. Uh, so that translates in delays and costs. Mm. For labs. Yeah, and also for researchers like myself, I did my PhD on a crustacean, which is a satellite model from the regular or typical uh, model systems in biology, in molecular biology and cell biology. And much of our research approaches would be based on fly research, but our model, the crustacean has a much bigger eggs. Um, we need a similar and yet different systems. And then the hardware is not as flexible as it used to be if, or as it would be if it was open and adaptable easily to the specific circumstances of the researchers. So yeah, so many reasons you know already. Andre. Yeah, can I just add something to all of this? I mean, I completely agree. And I think there are a couple of things, right? Um, all of these systems that we have where all of these things are proprietary and so on, they are not something that is, I mean, it's the way companies do things now, but it's not necessarily the only way to do things, right? Because we do now have examples of companies that are outside the science space that are really doing well for themselves, but are selling open source hardware, right? And the whole point is that instead of leveraging all this scarcity, right, with intellectual property and so on, they become service providers, mm. right? And so this flips a little bit like how companies operate, but um, there are a lot of, I mean, a lot, there is a handful of companies I would say that are making really well for themselves in much more competitive spaces like 3D printing, do-it-yourself electronics, and so on, that are running under newish business models that don't require um, closing everything away in secrets, mm. right? And in, in the context of science, everybody would benefit so much from this, right? Because, and this touches on another point, which is like, if you are in Africa or in South America, where some of us are from and so on, and you can buy something. It takes a long time to get there because it comes from Europe. Uh, it gets stopped at customs and so on. And once it breaks, there is nobody there to fix it, right? And so if it was open source hardware, you could have companies locally providing services around this and actually making use of these technologies that were developed in other places as well, mm. right? 
Um, yeah. Okay, so now we clarified why it makes sense to have in a research context, but now if we widen the scope a little bit. So um, open hardware makers is explicitly open for hardware projects inside academia, but also explicitly outside academia. Why did you yeah. choose to widen the scope for like, presumably <laughs> limitless? Would that be not more difficult for you guys? Or what's the idea behind a wider scope? Huh. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> I can give an idea, and but I think yeah. it would be good if we all complement the reply to that one. Um, personally, for me, I think that um, it's beneficial, that exchange between people who are thinking of science hardware and people who come with a different mindset and are thinking of hardware somewhere else. Because the interesting thing is that many of, uh, even beyond the domain, there are many practices that are shared and many um, design strategies because in the end you are producing a material object probably. And of course, science has some peculiarities and some quality control and some, some very specific stuff that needs to be addressed in different implementation contexts. But still, there are lots of lessons to be exchanged there and people can learn from each other. Um, absolutely. So um, what I want to add is also that we want to like open up the doors more to like, yeah, everybody. Um, we need an entry point also into the open hardware community. And that's what we want to, to provide here. So because... Um, um, I can now speak for myself. I, when I was um, like starting building things, and I, I thought, well, I, I want to contribute to to the open hardware community, but I had no idea where to start. And um, now there is an answer. OHM. <laughs> <laughs> You've created it. it. Yeah. And it's quite difficult because with open source software, you have Git, you have GitHub. But with open hardware, there are so many platforms and so many different communities that mm. you kind of need a gentle introduction to it. Mm. And that's how we see our program, that it's a gentle introduction into all of that. We introduce different communities, like general standards. We did not develop our own standards. We are referring to others who already did. And yeah, but uh, Andre, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. No, you can say. <laughs> So I was just going to say, right, I think like this summer, this this phrase on where we're doing a gentle introduction for people who want to learn this space, which is quite complex, is very good. Because if you think about it um, and complementing this idea that we didn't set up our own standards and everything, there are so many people from so many different areas talking about open hardware and trying to put a framework where it works in all spheres, right? So you have people who are lawyers who are talking about the legal aspects of this. And then of course we could not develop our own things because these people are really smart and have been thinking about this for a long time. So we, we make sure we point people in that direction so that they know the legal aspects of open hardware. And then there is the whole documentation, which is what kind of file formats, what needs to be considered and so on. And so you have a whole different association of people who spend a long time thinking about that and this is then also something that we leverage upon right and so the whole point is like how can we and i think this is how we contribute back to the community right because all of these people are investing so much time into developing these things and we're trying to condense everything in a way that it's easy for people to find and actually use it uh, because a lot of times for a lot of projects is always the same like people spend a lot of time developing in it but they have no idea how to like get the word out there mm. right and so we hope that this is how we also can uh, contribute uh, to this space. And I think we have a, an intentional goal also of like, there, there are three things that we have been writing a lot in our website, which is to, make, to help people make their projects reusable, sustainable, inclusive. And, and I think we, we have an idea of what open hardware projects should look like, right? And we are trying to support people in, in achieving that um, doesn't matter where they where they start or which domain they're in, but providing those strategies that are as 
Alex and Andre were mentioning curated by the community. It's not our own idea, just out of nowhere. Um, but are strategies that can help people think and reflect of their own projects as part of a bigger community. Yeah, so now this is a mentoring program. And you basically already explained why mentoring is necessary to provide the guidelines, to give structure, to help people find their way through the complex world of project design, project development on specific hardware examples or on, on the topic of open source hardware. Um, to make it, make it more tangible for our listeners or to give ideas, but like proceeding to this now, um, being soon to be launched or already launched. Um, new call for submissions of projects to be onboarded to the program. There was a pilot program, right? Would you, could you share a few examples of what kind of hardware projects were, were run through the program and where you think these might find sustainable application in society and research or wherever they were um, located? Yeah. So. It's funny because I recently had this conversation with somebody who was asking about the program. And so I can give you like three brief examples of things that um, really um, have an interesting point, right? So one of them is uh, a project um, that has been developed in Brazil, which are educational toys uh, called Alchemetricos, right? And the whole point is that this is hardware, this is analog hardware, right? Because it's basically there is zero electronics, but basically with these structures that they put together in these models, you can put like several different physical structures together. And the point was that the main developer had already like a big community and a lot of momentum going, but he was really kind of like by his own words, disorganized in terms of like, what do I do next? And like, how do I organize this community in the sense of how can I show people where we want this to go or how can we together figure out where we want this to go? And in the pilot, he said, this was amazing because I managed to, to get it. Were you, were, were you Joe, his mentor? Now? Yes, I was going to say. Mentor. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, and he was super happy to, to be mentored and, and, and to find like pace to like, how do I need to structure this so that there is a long-term plan and goal going ahead, right? And then there was also Auto DIY, which was a robotic, an open source robot. 3D printed components where people would just learn about electronics and robotics, right? Uh, which again, also had a community and also had momentum, but then also gained from documentation principles, what kind of files need to be shared and so on. And then the last one that I want to mention, um, sorry for hogging like time, um, is one project which was about developing sensors for monitoring rivers. Um, and after going through the program, the main developer there decided or found another community that was much more advanced in terms of the sensor than he was. And so he stopped developing the sensor that he was developed and developing and actually joined the other community, right? And, and this is one of the things we are trying to also show people, do you really need to start something new or should you contribute to an existing effort mm -hmm. and be part of a bigger thing, right? And I think these are three, three great examples from this from this cohort. Mm -hmm. from and the these are program. very, different if you if you think of their applications some of them are more educational um others are more the the data logger was more science activist in the beginning um there is also more professional scientists for example at universities with uc2 that was a project that is already established and was part of the of the pilot program mm -hmm. and they were really happy with how they could acquire best documentation practices for their existing and in general uh, working well project and in fact the person is coming back this round as a mentor uh, which for us is is a big success right um, so so i think uh, I, I think that that's a good example um and, I, and in terms of, of projects i think we're really wide on, on accepting submissions on purpose, right? We want to see what's out there and mm. how how connect this project. Great. So now for the for the program that's now open for applications, on the website you say that first of all, of course, people can submit their projects um, to be considered. How many projects will you run per term? 
and how long is the term? Like, in other words, please describe the program in a few words. Of course, people can also visit the website. We'll put the link in the show notes and there will be a blog post where, where you can find all the information. But just so pitch briefly so people get interested and are encouraged to consider their submission. Who wants to go? <laughs> we kind of know this by heart. Someone, It's a 16 week program. It's um, a 16, okay, go ahead, go ahead, please. It, it, it's, um, so o, uh, Open Hardware Makers is uh, a program that runs for 16 weeks. It's mentorship based, but it has a very strong component of peer review. So um, projects that apply and are selected, which will be between 15 and 20, probably, um, we never know the final number because it depends on applications and available mentors. We have a pool of mentors. Uh, but projects that are selected are paired with a mentor and they are also part of a cohort. So in this cohort, they uh, alternate between me meetings week, uh, every two weeks with a mentor and every other week with a group because we think there is a lot of value in that exchange with your fellow mentees, let's say. Uh, they go through these um, 16 weeks following a curriculum that is one of the things I think uh, we are providing most value in also besides the mentorship, which is this curated materials from all the community. Uh, it has eight models, very practical. They are just to apply those concepts to the project. And they have the opportunity to be assessed by a group of experts that are domain, that have, they have domain knowledge of open hardware uh, at the middle of the program, let's say. And the goal is that by the end of those 16 weeks, they can uh, share a public dem demo um, at a call so they can showcase what they learn in practice. Um, and yeah, that's that's mostly it, I think. I don't know if I forgot something. Is there any restrictions for who can apply? Also, because it's explicitly meant to be an inclusive program. So do you have like quotas for which, uh, people from what regions in the world or cultural backgrounds? Should, um, can apply and and do you have measures in place how to encourage that because sometimes um, an excuse or in another sphere of getting more women onto panels an easy excuse would be oh we had a call open but not no no women applied and I heard similar excuses. And also know from myself that it's, it's an extra effort that's needed sometimes to encourage people from certain world regions to take up such opportunities or even get access to such opportunities through hearsay, through internet presence, access to, to, the, to the materials like where they can find the program in the first place. So yeah, so the original question was, is there any restrictions? Is there an age restriction of some sort or otherwise? And how do you ensure inclusivity? So, so in regards yeah, to inclus ahead. inclusivity, <laughs> inclusivity, uh, inclusiveness, um, we actually uh, want to try. So what we do to we are doing this, ex we are going this extra mile, and we are um, trying to contact um, specific communities of like where we think that they might not hear about the program otherwise. So we. Well, we have networks everywhere and we send it out via this networks and we, we also hope that this uh, then reaches um, like smaller groups. And we want to provide and we want to help as, as far and as good as we can with also accessibility. So, for example, uh, we had like a, a very recent example where we talked about also Internet access and if it's possible for us to to provide a solution, like, for example, a, a Wi-Fi, um, like a SIM card um, router. Um, to connect them better to the Internet, then that's what we want to do. And uh, we also have a, a little, bit, little bit of funding to actually do that. Yeah. And um, in regards to like age restrictions, we don't restrict an age, um, but we have certain requirements in like in what kind of what stage your your project has to be. 
um, it is it should not be just like an idea. It should be already like um, quite concrete. And uh, what we are also asking for is um, some kind of online documentation. So um, something has to be already open and publicly available. It doesn't have to be perfect, though, because like, the yes. idea is that it improves through the program. <clears throat> I think, um, let, let me know if this is not like that, but uh, we're all part of the Gorsh community, which has quite some strong uh, diversity values and, and strategies. One second, just to explain to the listeners, um, the gathering for open science, open source hardware, but open source hardware. Science, yes. open science hardware. And for that, you also find the link to their website. In Thank you. I'm sorry mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. That's OK. So yeah, we're part of the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, which has quite strong uh, strategies in place for diversity. Mostly, for example, uh, there are demographics there. So we try to guide um, when, when, when we select projects. There is some uh, equilibrium there. and. We are applying for funding also and uh, for the program. And if this funding is successful, uh, we are expecting to provide, for example, support for not only the, like the data or the or, or SIM cards, but if someone needs childcare uh, in order to attend the program, um, we could only do that. We, we could also do that, sorry. Um, I think we have very present that most of the open hardware community is looking a lot to the north uh, because of our different trajectories and networks as Alex was mentioning. So we kind of intentionally uh, reach out to our networks in Latin America, in Africa, uh, now in, well, more and more in South Asia, I hope more, um, because we want, we want really to, to try to to make open hardware makers um, an instrument for increasing diversity in open hardware. Yeah, I think we can already see some practical results of that in our mentor pool, right? So, I mean, this is not released out yet, but it's gonna be soon. And a lot of people are from outside Europe and the US, right? So they have very different backgrounds and they are coming from different, you know, like not only academics and so on. And so this goes, um, I mean, happily shows that like, putting out fillers and, and sending out message to these other networks allows us to get more people from different spaces to contribute to this, right? Right. While involving people in, in the US and Europe, but it's just kind of yeah, no, absolutely. The, yeah. the center of gravity, you know, a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and so just one more point. So it mm -hmm. is in our plans. And I mean, this is going to depend on how well we do things and get funding and so on but we also want to translate the material, right? The curriculum. So now it's all English because this is more or less like the language that most people are able to, to navigate, right? But we also and the one want- we to, use between yeah, us. Yeah, and also the right? one we use between us, but we also want to translate this into different languages, right? Which also helps with including people from different communities and spaces. Mm. Yeah. And then to serve as a template for other similar programs to BAD in different regions of the world. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, we are also. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I'm I just wanted to add that we also like heavily are reflecting on that. So we are looking at where our mentees, mentors, and also experts come from and um, try to see where we can improve and also which groups we need to focus on more, like to contact them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so proactivity, pro yeah, to be proactive about inclusiveness is key. That's also what I learned in the projects that I engage in. Otherwise, um, you also mentioned mentors and experts in the program and like people would be interested not to, to join with their own project, but as an expert or mentor, what would they have to bring to the table to be to be able to call themselves an expert of open hardware makers? Um, I think most of it is listening, right? I think they have to bring to the table the willingness to listen and to think about common solutions with people. And so, I mean, in practical terms, if you want to be a mentor, we hope that you have two hours a week uh, to look at the project and discuss things with the mentee that you have. So two hours per project that you want to mentor. Um, 
And I mean, you don't need to be an open hardware specialist to be a mentor. Uh, you just really need to listen to what people are struggling with and try to come up with ideas on where and what they could work on, right? And how could they could structure the project and so on. I mean, the other, I mean, Alex and Julio can add to this if you want. And then if you're an expert, um, then by the name itself, you should be an expert in something, right? <laughs> Uh, it could be like open hardware or maybe like one of the projects actually wants to be set up to become a business, right? And so if you are a specialist in, in startups or something like that, right? Then we could also use your expertise or maybe you are an expert in community building because this project really wants to build a community. So like you could do consultation as needed throughout the program. So really, again, it's like really wide open because we don't know exactly what kind of expertise people might need. Mm -hmm. um, and for this, the time commitment is a little bit smaller. It's an on-demand basis, so to say. And so on average, I would say maybe like half an hour per week if you are consulted. Like if you were to be consulted every week, right? I think this would, yeah, you know what I mean? Um, and then also, if you're an expert, part of the program is an expert review. And so there'll be a moment where all the experts are going to look at all the documentation and going to make comments and suggestions, sort of like a peer review. Mm -hmm. of the documentation of each project yeah I, and give, I like, cons to, to give constructive feedback on and to guide further yeah uh, absolutely uh, mentees. Julie? i think mentors are kind of the heart of the program um and they are people who as andrea was mentioning they are not maybe domain no they don't have knowledge or expertise on, on a domain of application of a project, but they are able to have the big picture in mind and they are able, they know our program very well and they know our curriculum very well and what the goals of that program are. So they can support the mentee in achieving those goals, whatever they are. Um, mentors also should be very willing to not work uh, hand to like, side by side on the project that connect the project to networks they have available. Um, and I think uh, a very a very interesting change that we implemented in this version of it from now on is that we are going to provide mentors with professional training because we really, really think that, um, again, mentors are one of the core values of, of open power makers. So, um, how to listen, how to provide feedback that is useful and not, doesn't destroy the person, how to connect the project to other communities. Those are all features that we would love to see in mentors. And this is my personal opinion. I would love to have mentors that grow with the program. Um, so you don't have to be a certified mentor just to join as a mentor. You want mm -hmm. to you have, to have the time and be willing to go through training um, and learn a lot how about program works and because all the content is um is not we will uh, open power makers doesn't doesn't teach you how to do 3d printing right just to be clear on that or or how to work on arduino or things like that uh it, it teaches you so something else so that's where experts come in right because technology changes all the time and one today you will have one technology and in five years we'll have another one so the way in which we respond to those changes in technology is by put, like calling the experts that can assess projects in those specific um, domains. Uh, and yeah, uh, we are always open for applications for mentors and experts. So the, the core of the program itself is basically to support the mentees also in project management. And like it's, or, it's already at a, a level after the ideation project, you probably already have a clear idea of how the idea can be applied, preferably already a, what is it? Um, not the pilot, but like something like a prototype. A prototype. Yeah. You, for, we will ask you to have um, a concrete idea, some references to similar projects, uh, bill of materials, which is a list of things you need to build your project. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, let's say a prototype, um, kind of documented online somewhere that we can see. 
uh, this is not because we are excluding people, but just we we learned in the pilot that when when people have put some time into thinking and documented publicly uh, a first prototype, they are more committed to the program. Yeah. yeah, and we also encourage them to look for other other projects, similar projects. So because this is like the major message, like in the very beginning, don't reinvent the wheel. Mm. Yeah. Or do That's it to what... learn, but, <laughs> but then, you know, uh, seize the, the experiences from others. Right. OK. Um, oh. And then um, one last question, what I also saw on your website, um, to become a sponsor or partner, what would you wish for, or do you already have partners you want to mention here and others that you would like to see join? Like in what area should they be operating to qualify as a partner to this program? So we see the possibility that this program could be also like hold at a university for, for example, PhD students, like for a close group groups, let's say. This is something um, where we could see like at a university as a partner. And um, yeah. Other mm -hmm. partners could be companies that are developing open hardware. Uh, many, many companies, as Andre mentioned, in the open hardware space develop tools for other hardware to be built. Um, so if you are a company, you are developing hardware that you would like people to use in projects, why not sponsor a cohort? And yeah, we, we can, we can uh, kind of uh, promote that. Mm -hmm. Because the best, the better documented is your, the project that somebody uses your tool, the more chances there is that people will actually reproduce it, right? So yeah, I think it's totally under. in line. Yeah. <laughs> in line with that yeah i'm also so i mean it's worth mentioning as well um that we do have an open collective um that we want also uh want to use to be able to fund some of this project so we can also share a link um okay. this is linked also on the website but yeah so if people feel like we deserve a coffee or something like that you can do a one-time donation for two euros or two pounds or whatever right and we and then or yeah, anything else. Um, yeah, and I think other than that, what Huli and Alex said, I think these are, yeah. And we do have an research. ongoing collaboration with Open Life Science. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yes. Another mentorship program that is focusing on life sciences and open practices in life sciences for research. Um, we kind of have the same origin, let's say, from when we are both forks of Mozilla Open Leaders. That's where we met. And we have very similar strategies and kind of <clears throat> values. So we have um, yeah, an ongoing collaboration there. Yeah, I think something also important to mention is that our whole curriculum was now completely like, like reworked uh, we um, did a review process with a lot of people from the community and this was also sponsored or we, we got funding from mozilla to do that so also to pay back and give a honorary to um, our experts which contributed that is true. Yeah. Yeah. I think one more thing that is worth mentioning uh, is our hosting institutions, right? So being based at the university, it's not always the case. I mean, at least for me that like you get time to work on, on like it is related to what I do, of course, but it's not feedbacking straight into the labs, right? So I really feel glad that at the University of Sussex and the Department of Neurosciences, I have the time and space to work on this as well. So yeah. I'd like to leave that one out there too. Of course. Yeah. Like it's I, that's also what I experience in the projects around like Africa Archive and other initiatives that we're all stronger together. And um it's never one individual, one organization alone. It's usually through the support, be it monetary or hands-on or you know, partnership, encouraging. Sometimes it's just a phone call, encouraging words. That's can mean a lot. And um, be very much uplifting to carry us through the next couple of months. Um, maybe towards closing this um, this chat, um, what's like if you share with with our audience, what what's driving you to 
individually, personally, to run this project because we're all busy people. Each of you has, is um, also busy in other projects, um, research, running a company. Um, and now you devote your time also to this mentoring program. Why? <laughs> Why, why, like, do you see that as complementary to the other work, like the other kind of um, projects that you have, as a family, um, and how is this benefiting you? Um, just to share the drive and passion for you to work as a team in this particular program. Um, Alex, do you want to start? So I'm currently managing a fab lab. So I have to do a lot of, like, I'm dealing with a lot of people developing projects and, um, I, that's what I described in the very beginning. They are really curious and they see so many open projects out there and they just want to be part of the community, but yeah, they are sometimes missing the entry point. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said in the very beginning, we want to provide or I want to provide, I want to help providing an entry point into this community. This is one part. And another huge part for me is also contributing to the open source community in general, because I profited so much from the community and this is my way of giving back. I'm copying and uh, like forking other projects, um, like basically on a daily basis <laughs> and um, working with, uh, with things others developed. And um, I'm so glad that I or we can actually contribute and give something back to the community this way. Mm. Thank you. Julie? For me, I think it's um, like um, in my day-to-day -day job, I'm a researcher, I'm a social scientist, and I study open hardware as a, as a case study of democratizing science and technology, particularly in, in, for building infrastructure for research in the global. And, and this is always being concerned with like the the policy, like the top level, how, how do we support this to become default, let's say, in some future. Um, but I think there is a lot of potential in the bottom up um, way too. And kind of, I, I really like the slogan that we have in Twitter that is uh, making open hardware default one project at a time. Mm. And and I, I really believe that. I think there is a, there is a whole, um, Let's put it this way. Open hardware has a full potential of change in the way we perceive manufacturing and in particular science and technology. If we don't diversify it, if we, we don't ensure that it's um, available for everyone and accessible for everyone, then this will, this will probably become something that is another form to complete, another requirement to make, and it won't change anything, right? So my motivation for Open Hardware Makers is to just ensure that as many people as possible are part of the conversation. Mm. Thank you, and Andre. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I have a combination of what Alex and Huli said, right? Like I also am working at the university with so many open projects and it will be quite nice for people to see what is the standard and like, this would make everybody's life much easier in the long run. But then also only, not only, but also outside my little university space, it would be a dream if open hardware was the norm and not the exception, right? To the point where things are so properly done that you don't, as a user, you don't even have to know that something is open hardware or not, right? Um, in the same way that if you use a very decent piece of software, because it's so good, like you as a user, sometimes you don't even consider whether it's open or not and so on, like you don't care about that. And so for me, for science initially, but then for everything else, I would say, right? It would be awesome if people don't even have to think about, mm -hmm. hmm, should I go for this way? Is it open? Is it not? It's just simply like the open is what works best. And this is what, has, is what everybody's using, right? So yeah, I think that's it. Great. Thank you very much, um, Kole, Alex, and Andre. Um, we like again for anybody out there listening. Um, you're more than welcome to explore the website. It's uh, switch to Open Collective. Well, on Open Collective, you can support the project at opencollective.com/open-hardware-makers. Uh, yeah, that's it. And then um, the website is openhardware.space.
um, where you find all the details, how to apply, um, any details about the project, uh, the program itself, and how to how to apply, how to become a sponsor, mentee, and mentor. Um, and our applications are open right now. So if you have a project, feel free to apply. Uh, it's not a very long application, and we would love to hear from you. Great. Yes. So, and in case you're listening to this after the applications are gone, still send us an email. We would love to hear from you and, and like send you information about when the next cohorts are opening and everything else. We expect right. approximately two cohorts per year. Per year yeah. 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 So that's quite a decent pace for people to tinker further and then submit an improved version or you know, a matured version to the next cohort. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably already ready for this one. So take a look at yeah. the website <laughs> thank you thank so you. much and thank you, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you as well